All right, so we are live here today with Richard Noel. Um, so Hello, glad everybody. to have you on. It's night I'm there, just, but obviously. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's yeah. an absolute pleasure, uh, Rainier. I just want to check I've got your name right. It is Rainier, isn't yeah. it? Because I, yes. I had to ask yes, you before that, but uh, <laughs> it's a bit of an unusual name that. But so, can I, so I'm yes. going to ask you a question first. So, how did you come <laughs> up with the name Reindeer's Beard? Um, so when I was born, my sister uh, thought my name was Reindeer. And so I've literally had the nickname since birth ever since I was a really little kid. So oh, that's really yeah, cool. That's, uh, that's, how it, that's how it started. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good to have a, a name or a brand that is completely different because then everyone remembers <laughs> you straight away. <laughs> yeah. Yep. If you if you look up my name, there's only one thing that comes up also. Yeah, exactly. You're easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd say before right. we start, if you want to find another yeah. YouTuber, he's really good, got some really cool little things on his channel. He's only just started yeah. the last couple of years, haven't you? Um, and there's some really good good uh, talks you've got on that. Log on to your channel. There you go. There's a free shout for you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, so You're can welcome. you just in introduce yourself and tell us about your operation? Yeah, sure. OK, my name is uh, Richard Knoll. Uh, I'm uh, a beekeeper in Brittany, France. So I'm quite near St. Marlow, which is kind of a, the biggest port. It's not a very big yeah. place, but um, in France, it's fairly uh, countrified. We're, we're pretty in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> yeah. but we have everything near us. A um, bit like kind of some places in America, I imagine. Uh, I run um, a lot of, uh, well, not a lot. I run Dadent Hives, uh, Dadent yeah. Nukes, uh, and Mini Plus. Uh, about 200 production hives, about yeah. 100 nukes every year that I either use myself or sell. Uh, and I also do have some mating nukes that the numbers go up and down like everyone else's does. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what I do. I've been professional for the last four years, but I've given up my from France you can actually have more than one job and be what they call pluriactive it's called so so I've, but I've got rid of my landscape gardening job in the last um two years really and just scale back because after Brexit believe it or not is that's like a natural wastage thing where yeah. a lot of clients I used to have they kind of either retired or died <laughs> or got old and moved away <laughs> it's not quite that yeah. bad but it's just like yeah. the way I, I wanted to give up straight away anyway, but I, it was just kind of you know it worked really well for me to be honest it's about the only thing about brexit has helped is now i'm the full-time beekeeper through my choice but also with a little bit of a push because i had no other clients so but yeah uh, yes that's kind of what i do um in a nutshell so you said and, and you live um, pretty close to the france coast right yeah, yeah so we're literally probably 10 minutes if you want to go to a really nice beach it's 20 minutes nice Golden Sands, clean water. We uh, like a lot of the Brittany coastline. It's very muddy. You got a, a lot of estuary type yeah. areas. So we, if you want to go somewhere really nice, you, you go like just kind of bits, a couple of clicks to the left, and it's beautiful. But in the yeah. summer, we go and swim in the sea in the summer. In the winter, it isn't very nice. It's like eight no. degrees centigrade the sea. Probably very much like you is what you are when you go to the coast. You know. Yeah, we actually. That's it's it's pretty similar. We're about. I'd say there's two big beaches: Popham Beach and Reed State Park. And they're like maybe 30 or 45 minutes from our house. So we're also right on the coast as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It also, it, go ahead. No, so I was saying, I was just going to say, so um, how many colonies are you running at the moment yourself? I'm just interested to. Yeah. Um, I have 15 right now. Um, hope to have 25 plus five nukes before winter. That's kind of my goal for this year. Um, yeah. And I started last year with seven, and I got up to eighteen before winter. Awesome. So have you have you seen that they all made it through virtually, or you? Uh, do you yes. Know? Good. Yeah. So I so I I looked them all, and I've got fifteen of the eighteen. And today I was going through my dead outs for the second time because I, I was really inspired. I was listening to Etienne's talk from Hive Life, and yeah. he's like, "There's there's always a reason." You just got to figure it out. There's always something you can do as a beekeeper to event that loss the next year. So I was really digging in and trying to figure out each one what it was. And I have I have a better idea, definitely. Um, and I've got I saw one that had some pretty bad digestion issues. And I figured out um, that it was likely a cause. So I, I tried running no uh, upper entrance this year. And all my other colonies have been able to fly. 
But this one colony, for whatever reason, they had too many viruses or something. And so there's enough dead bees to block the entrance. And so I think that's why they're pooping all over the inside of the colonies because they just couldn't get out. Yeah. And so I, I yeah, yeah. took out their entrance reducer, swiped the bees out, and hopefully they didn't get any diseases from pooping all over the hive, but you know, maybe it'll be a loss, yeah. we'll see. But all the other ones, I mean, have you, have you, even, yeah. Carry on, sorry, carry on, sorry. Yeah, so the, so I hope, hopefully, I, I'm fairly confident they'll, they'll all make it. I mean, we'll have some more nights in probably the mid twenties, but, um, just, you know, slow, slow increase, like to give you an idea, I think it's a pretty good way to, to compare climates. Like we can do our first grafting here, maybe mid May around the 15th ish. That's generally when I go for it. Yeah. Mm. We're, we're kind of similar. Uh, we can graft in April, but you've got to be a yeah. bit careful. Um, you can get some cold nights. I mean, I've seen frost in June here, but if you've yeah. got big colonies, I mean, the, the, the bees seem to build up anyway. Yeah. These two weeks, around these two weeks is when we usually get our first inspections done or first look at the hives. Sometimes it yeah. can be earlier, but it's pretty rare. The last two years, uh, or last year was exceptionally warm and mild, but not really any further forward with the bees. So it was about the same time. I mean, as beekeepers, yeah. you understand, we all talk about one week here and one week there, and other people <laughs> think we're nuts because we know it so well. They think, how can you talk about a one week being specifically a little bit ahead just because we're so know what our yeah. flows are and everything else but exactly um, yeah i think i'm yeah. similar to you for grafting um what once we do get the first graft in generally it settles down then and we can graft right till i usually try and do the last if i do graft and i've got drones and there's no major asian hornet problem that's my couple if we've got asian yeah. hornets that there's hardly any drones after after july for two reasons first of all the queen's been them out earlier because they the colony's under stress secondly the hornets eat them anyway so um, I can graft in, I've grafted in August and had good overwintered bees if I'm mm. an ivy flow the end of the year. But it's such a variable thing. So really, you've got to last graft July. Mm. I know um, yeah. several beekeepers near you do their last graft early July and then that's it. So the season is always really short. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I, think I grafted just, late. Just, sorry, but... I think if you, if you don't try and give your bees time to get ready for the winter that's when you're shooting yourself in the foot sometimes that's what i've learned and i've done it so many times where i thought i'd just do one more graph <laughs> and it goes well and they just don't make it no matter how good it seems you just got to have yeah. that cut off yeah it's 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 always a balancing act and especially when your season's short because you know we we don't it's not this isn't alabama we're not going to get you know 10 months of the year in uh no, no. expecting weather you know it's you yeah. You've got this much of a margin for error, and you've got to toe the line and be careful. I've seen those guys already grafting in Alabama, and, and they're and they're like they're even saying perhaps we're doing it a bit early this year because they've got variable weather as well. So um, yeah. it swings and roundabouts, you know. It's just beekeeping, as we say. Yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like last year. So when I was going through my dead out today, I really the one takeaway that I had is I couldn't get rid of my mating nukes, like and sell off the queens till September. And so my guess is even if they didn't have super high mite counts, there was enough virus exposure. I mean, I still had 15 hives to go through. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a terrible winter. But yeah, um, my guess is a lot of those three losses had something to do with not being able to treat the mating nukes. Uh, yeah. I don't quite understand what, what you say when you've not been able to treat the mating yeah. nukes. Oh, I mean, so, against mites. Yeah, yes. yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, you, yes. You, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So okay. I, I combined them late and then got treatment on on like September 3rd or 4th, but they probably had already been making winter bees for at very at the very least two weeks. And so some of them I think had low mite counts and others didn't. Like one of my highs, it definitely wasn't how many bees it was. It like the entire bottom board was completely covered in bees, like dead bees. Like mm -hmm. it was not a too small to make it through winter type issue. So mm -hmm. it and I saw it in the fall and it was a booming colony. So I would guess it was a virus issue um, or maybe the mite treatment didn't work as well as I thought it would. And I didn't get enough tests in after in late September. So I would guess that would be my main issue from this year. Um, and then I had another colony, very few bees. Like that one was definitely just didn't have enough bees for winter and I shouldn't have tried to stretch my hive count that far out. And then the third one, um, the jury's still out. I don't really have an idea yet. Have you thought about Nozema as well? Have you any idea that might be a Nozema high count or 
Uh, yeah, so I didn't see any poop. And that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have an um, Yeah, exactly, because there is two types, as you know. So Yeah, yeah. so I, it could have something to do with that. Um, it It shouldn't be – they shouldn't have super bad dysentery because – we don't really get a fall flow like at least half the years. And so I fed like 600 pounds of sugar. So yeah, that means that their food was relatively clean. So if there was a gut issue, it was probably from the actual, uh, from the, the parasite, not the food. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I thought we'd, we, we, we'd talk we, here. We don't, we don't seem to suffer much from it. Not that I do much uh, checking against those in but we know yeah. when we get my death, because basically the bees just go off. When you generally get a mite deaths, everyone says, oh, there's no bees in hive. It can't be mites. They just disappeared. And then there's a tiny <laughs> cluster. That's the classic death because basically the bees know they're ill. It's and they gone. go off and yeah. die. And yeah. They just get less and less and less. And suddenly that colony collapse. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's very difficult. But what I say, I would say in my limited experience, beekeeping when you become bigger is just a game of numbers. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm like, I've got big losses this winter. I've just been finding stuff today, um, but I'm not surprised. It was for a number of reasons I kind of screwed up last summer, but there's nothing I could do about it, you know. So I'm, but I've got nukes. I've got most of my nuke battery will make most of my replacements, and I've got queens coming early. So, yeah. you know, I know Ian talks about it a lot, and he's just put up a message, and I'll get to you in a minute, Ian. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think you just, no matter what you do with beekeeping, you've got to make them nukes in the summer. You just have to do yeah. that because it's your security. And you, you know, you, you, you can't get away from the fact that having a nuke is just that amazing resource that is there ready for you to use. And you can do so much with it and you can pick it up and move it so easily. <laughs> in, invaluable for sure. That's this, like this year, my goal is to have 25. Once I combine my mating nukes into hives, I want to have. 25 hives and then eight nukes, five to overwinter, three for my refreshes. And that way oh, I can, cool. you know, hit my goals. Yeah. Yeah, but you're, you're going you're gonna to have more than that by the end of the year, I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. Because so. when we say, I'll just get 10 more, that means 20 more. <laughs> <We're keeping. laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the world's biggest lie. You so, know it. Uh, uh, yeah, hey, Richard, how's the honey house go? Uh, honey house construction going? Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, yeah, it's, it's going good. Um, there's a little bit of a delay going through, just trying to get the net. I've got to prepare the, the main floor area now for where the extraction room is going to be. And I've got just, I've got so much on at the moment. So I'm kind yeah. of a victim of my own busyness. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I'm, everyone yeah. else has been doing work for me. And I've, I've spent a lot of time watching what they're doing and helping out and making and being project manager. And that's kind of why I've lost a lot, probably lost a lot of hives mm -hmm. over the winter because I haven't been looking at my nukes. But I don't think that would have any difference at all. But, um, you know, I've only, uh, my nukes have only got low losses, probably five to eight percent. So I'm really pleased with that. And that's with no intervention over the winter. They were well fed, all treated against mites. So they've done well. And it hasn't been that cold in fairness. So, but do you, uh, do you think, no, I'm just, sorry, carry on. Do you think that that's because they had new queens or you just, yeah. spent more time on them i think it's because well i think it's it's a double thing also all my nukes were in an area where there was a lot of nukes in one area and i've learned this year when i'm dealing with asian hornets is if you get a bad year you're better off just bringing all your hives into one or two areas because if you imagine like the shoal of fish scenario yeah if you've got a big shoal of fish and there's predators on the outside picking them off the the chance of one or two of those in the middle go, it's, it's much less as, as a global yeah. amount and that's it's it's kind of a bit of a weird comparison, but it kind of works because you've got the same number of nests around, but a much bigger concentration of the bees, so there's less pressure on each colony. Mm -hmm. So we, we are honestly hoping that last year was the exceptional year that we've been dreading for years. Um, yeah, I did a video on it recently. How I, I don't know the way forward to be honest, other than loads of spring trapping. I brought new traps. Um, the actual local commune group is all also organizing massive spring trapping to see if it's going to yep. work because we have to try something what is there they spend a fortune it's called dino aglo dino agglomeration mm -hmm. dino is my, my local big town and they excuse me they run all the communes around like 35 communes in this group so they're going to try this year group trapping of spring queens 
Now, we're going to get some bycatch. We're going to get some flies, some insects, maybe, you know, yeah. some beneficial insects, but not many anyway. And long term, if we see a massive reduction in founding queens and nests that they have to destroy later on, we know it's worth it because the yeah. the damage these ecosystem depressors do is huge to the environment around. So um, and, and I, I said in my last in one of my videos, I think two videos ago about when I was telling you one about when they did an analysis of the Asian hornet's gut, they found it was a lot of wasps. And that's why our wasp population just disappeared. And we had a terrible load of yeah. wasps last June, July. It was like, oh, this is going to be a bad end to the year. They all just disappeared. The reason why? Because the Asian hornets have eaten most of them. So that's what we're trying to do, spring trapping. Um, yeah. We have to try something. So, uh, yeah, I digressed a bit there. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I mean, pests with agriculture are everything. I mean, it, it's, it's well, it's more than just a pest because, you know, it, it doesn't just damage your bees. But it's uh, it's such a large project, I'm sure, to undergo, um, even as a well, town. It is. It is. Yeah. Just... I mean, my, my actually, my, my ex-colleague, Christian, I used to work with, he's kind of retired now anyway, and he's actually spending time going meeting groups of an evening and showing them how to do it. So th yeah. that's really good of him to do that. And it's like there's someone out there just um, just doing uh, what they can to help because we have to try, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it's good. It's a good thing, but... Because we're doing it, we'll have some recall in a few years' time to say, yes, that was worth it, or yes, it wasn't. It's all very well sitting on a fence going, well, maybe, and doing nothing. <laughs> we're trying it, and we have to try something, you know, because, uh, well, it's not just us. It's everyone in Spain, in yeah. Portugal, in a whole of Europe. Germany are just getting them now. I'm getting emails myself from people in sort of distant parts of Europe, you know, where these Asian yeah. hornets are actually starting to penetrate, and they could have it bad in a few years as well. It's just a pain in the backside. It really is. So, um, how long have you had them? They came into southern France in, near Bordeaux in, in the area called the Gironde in 2004. Okay. And it took That's them important. about six years to really move through central France and come up six to eight years. But they've never really been that bad because we've never had a summer like last year. Kind of were a bit sorry the summer before the summer of 2021 we're a bit kind of relaxing and it's not too bad we didn't really worry about doing any autumn trapping mm -hmm. because there's a week or two the end of the season we can yeah. trap a lot then we had that amazingly mild winter then we had a fantastic spring then we mm -hmm. had a really really hot summer and it just went <sighs> so we were all like scratching our heads going what did we do wrong but um yeah getting back to the nukes again uh, as mike mike palmer's yeah. just come on and said there are, there are a few problems in beekeeping that can't be fixed with a nuke. Absolutely right, Mike. And I've got you to thank for that because he's the one that talked about <laughs> it in the first place. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I used a bunch of pushing cages last summer. Um, and I got the idea because I wanted to requeen most of my hives every year. And so I thought, well, that's the way to do it because putting them in a queen cage in a full-size colony is not a recipe for success necessarily. No, and there's so, always issues. Yeah. It, it <laughs> There's depends always on the type of beast. So some people I know can just do it. Some people <laughs> seem to be able to be able to introduce queens, you know, mated queens into another colony. And, and it, don't forget, it's the condition of the queen you're introducing. And that's why pushing cage is so good because it allows mm, the queen yes. to become a laying queen while she's under the cage. And then um and then she's able to uh to to be similar to the outside bees, and then that pheromone transfers through i mean i when i went to mike's in 2006 15 it was i think it was just amazing because we were just all we were doing we're putting queens under pushing cages so yeah and i learned so much and uh it was really cool but i think mike's bees are really well trained they, they didn't screw up at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i'm i'm gonna try to make it out there at some point you know i'm only a few hours away so we'll see i'll i'll reach out it's to them really, at some point it's a really cool experience because you know the, you just it's like when you go anywhere, you just see so much. But that was yeah. like, I, I got after I keep telling Mike, and he's very modest about it, but I got a lucky break. I got the chance to <laughs> I was there for a week, you know, and it was at doing bees every day. The weather was actually it was actually stinking hot that week. And uh, <laughs> um it just it just went amazingly well. And a really nice bunch of people Mike had worked from, from at the same time as well. But there you go. I mean, it's it's I'm not surprised because Mike's a nice guy anyway. So, you know, apart from being miserable most of the time, he's a really nice guy. So <laughs> 
He'll be chuckling to himself now. Yeah, um, Richard. Um, yeah, he. Uh, uh, Ian's favorite. Uh, Ian loves your loading pad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's uh, it was like it's a bit of an extravag extravagance. I explained that. So I did my slab for the building, and I got another a uh, couple of extra things done. And then I had these guys back to do uh, like the hard landscape and outside because I needed rain gullies and put. And I just said. How much yeah. would it cost to dig out that? Because you're here with your digger <laughs> and all this. And I needed a pad, but not necessarily that big. But I just thought, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I think it was about 2,000 euros more, in, including all the other work in the budget. So it yeah. was well, well worth doing it. And now it's there forever. You know, so I've just got, I still haven't got any extra gravel in to back for a little that. But I, I wanted to leave it two weeks to, uh, to, 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 um, to really dry well. But yeah, it's cool. You can't, also I can chuck stuff on it, on pallets now, outside, yeah. and then move it around the pad <laughs> on pallets. And then it just gives you that massive flexibility. Take them inside, bring them out. Things like, um, I'm gonna do all my cleaning of my hives in that little shed I've got at the bottom eventually. But in the meantime, I'll put, uh, I, well, how we do it is we have a, a gas bottle and a burner, and we have a bin, yeah. you know, like a, a, um, a drum. And we have like a supporting wooden frame on the top. So you put your hives on top of the drum, but all that will go on mm. a half pallet. I can move that around, for example, and take it outside, work outside if the weather's nice. It just gives you that. Having a, a pallet truck is like such a revelation to me. I've used them before. I've had them in other places where I used to share my previous workshop. But moving into that area is all new to me. And palletizing everything is just a dream. It really is. You know, once you go yeah. into pallets, it just... This, it's effortless, really, to be honest. You mean you know? to move hives or um, hives no, I, or? I, yeah, I, I'm okay. sorry to interrupt, but I, I'm not at the yeah. uh, the stage of having a like a bobcat or a mini loader. That is another realm. Uh, <laughs> yes, another it realm is, for I sure. would love to go into, but I, I honestly <laughs> couldn't justify it. I couldn't justify yeah. having a load. I need another member of staff or a member of staff to justify um, all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And um, it's just massive to have that. You you really need really th two more members of staff. You need an extra f 500 hives to, to be to make it <laughs> worthwhile. And then you, I'm not being funny, but then you've got to work your ass off the whole time. You never go like, oh, I'm on a day off. Or the beauty of doing what I do is I, I hope or I believe that when it's all finished and when I'm kind of set up to how I want it to be, yep. I'll be able to like work hard and have a bit of a break in the winter. Whereas if you have an employee, there's no stopping. Yeah. That's that's the thing. You enter that realm where you've got to be, you know, if you, if you can get it right, I believe you can work your socks off in the summer and then kick back a bit in the winter and travel and go to Hive Life and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. This is what I'm getting at. Whereas if you if you have an employee, you're tied. You know, unless you can get seasonal. And the problem is in France, it's very very difficult to um, to have seasonal staff because you've got to employ them on a full time contract and uh, French employment laws, I'm not saying anymore. <laughs> so do you see what I'm getting at, though? That whole thing of having yeah. th that ability to move stuff on my own is going to make my life so much easier because you, there's stuff you just cannot not do. You know, um, you need to stack pallets. You need to stack, sorry, you need to stack hives, excuse me, on pallets. You need to be able to move it around. And having that flexibility and a, and a decent landing pad or working pad, not a landing pad, although it's big <laughs> enough to land on. <laughs> um, it's, it's just like the icing on the cake to me. So all my mates keep phoning me up going, which part of the pad are you on? I say, I'll let you know. Hang on, I just I can't quite see <laughs> all this rubbish like that, but it's all a bit of a joke. But uh, no, it's, I'm, I'm kind of really privileged. Yeah, um, a lot of beekeeping videos have said, like, buy once, cry once, and I feel like that's a pretty prime situation there, you know? Like if you add yeah. that, if you add that pad on, it's the amount of time you're going to save in the long run is just ridiculous. I know, I know, it, it really is, and that's what I kind of figured. I'm just going to bite the bullet and risk it a bit, um, because I just think when when you've got a digger on site, to us in France, right, having a digger on site is like pretty difficult to get when you've got one yeah. inside you get everything done that you can feasibly get done before they go up because you'll never get them back um yeah. 
<laughs> Asked Richard about the size of the room he demanded at Hive Life. I can vouch. That room was pretty um, full. It, it yeah, could fit like 3,000 people. I, and, I think um, they just turned up because they felt sorry for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they flew you uh, across a continent just because just they felt sorry for you, Richard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I know. Yeah, well, I'm just, I've told you, I'm just humble to it all. It was an amazing experience. Um, I'd love to go back one day. Cayman was amazing. How he organized that and pulled that off, um, I just don't know. It was just fantastic, you know. But it was it, for me to, to speak to that amount of people was just my, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, and Ian's gone on about it. He goes, well, you pulled a big crowd. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know how. I think it was just I was in the right slot, the right time. Everyone went, oh, let's uh, go and watch this. Sure. Let's just go and watch this, you know. Or they, or they must have drugged them or something because there was so many. I took a couple of selfies with my phone before yeah. I did the presentation. It's like, Talk, yeah, yeah. I, I look at them, I'm, I'm like, did I speak to all those people? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you're speaking to a lot more people on the recordings too. Uh, like yeah, on, well, on his website so. too. Yeah. I was gonna, yeah. I mean, um, I, I really think the recordings are brilliant, and uh, I, I think that's I haven't I haven't still to this point seen a lot of the other speakers yet. So I'm looking forward to yeah. to, to get a copy of them myself. I know Cayman's uh, going to give everyone a copy who was a speaker, um, but I'm looking forward to if I <laughs> when I get time because. <laughs> you know the problem at the moment is there's so many good people YouTubing. I feel obliged to watch everyone else's channels, and I just don't get time. You've got to like put it on, and um, and and you you've got to put put the put the channel on and just kind of work with it in the background, and try and catch as much you can. Because you I'm like I missed that and I missed that. What was he talking about? You know, and it, it's really difficult. It's a real challenge because you <laughs> you feel you want to because you like that channel, but you just physically don't have the time. It's really hard, you know. Yeah, I, I listen to a lot of stuff uh, like, you know, beekeeping videos can be visual, but I, I pick up a lot of stuff from just even just listening to the people talking in the videos. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's really cool. I'm an, I'm an aud auditory learner. Like I do much or I do pretty well. Like I can listen to stuff on 2x speed so I can get through hours and hours of stuff really quickly. And I'll just listen for like the whole day. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, awesome. I, I must admit that one thing I do like is podcasts. And they're really good as well because you literally can have that on in the background and you do yeah. you can take it in. But uh, it, it, there's so many people doing really good podcasts as well now. So, you know, there's the B team yeah. and all things like that. People, uh, um, I think Kim Flotton, Kim Flotton, is it? And another guy doing a podcast. He's is really yeah. good. Um, I, I just have trouble kept keeping up with it though, you know, and sometimes <laughs> I'm just like, it's just mind boggling, you know? Yeah, it's, I feel like that's, that's like the advantage of starting beekeeping. So I started like five years ago. So I was, that was 2018. And I don't, I don't know if that was the very beginning, but I feel like it's really where YouTube and podcasts started to pick up steam like a lot in from like that time from around 2015. Yeah. Since, since yeah. then it's really taken off. And I like, I've learned, like I went to beginning bee class, but you know, there's only so much they can teach you. I learned like the vast majority of what I know from people like you, Richard. Well, it's really kind. Thank you. But uh, I was going to say, uh, getting back to what you said about it taking off. Um, yeah. When I first started, I've, I've been keeping bees 12 years this year, and I didn't really do any mm -hmm. videos probably to the first maybe three or four years when I got into it. That's when I kind of dared yeah. to do a video on the light. I was <laughs> just like shed weld and doing it in my shed and all that. And I kind of felt that I was maybe using it to help myself, and which I, which I still do now. But it was great because it's uh, YouTube gives you uh, a, a tool for your own um, your own development because I yeah. look I, I use expression look what bees did for me all the time I mean, I've just <laughs> been to Hive Life and presented to over a thousand people if I never yeah. had done a YouTube channel I never that would never have got that happened, opportunity yeah. it's yeah. just like no. you know and and I I was dead nervous. Uh, coming over because I was thinking, my God, there's going to be so many people. There. <laughs> and you know what? I got there and I just thought, do you know what? I've done, I've done zooms. I've done some presentations to like forty or fifty people, WIs, all that kind of stuff. You know, um, yeah. meetings. And wh when I went to there, I just thought, it's just the best thing to do is just enjoy it because you you probably never get asked again. <laughs> so just make the most of it. But when I was doing the big presentation in that huge room, it was like doing a Zoom because I couldn't see the audience because the um, because the the lights were so bright and all yeah. I could see was my screen. So in some respects, that was actually quite quite kind of calming. <laughs> but getting back to the 
to what you're talking about before, um, it YouTube has taken, and I, and I honestly feel that if I hadn't started my YouTube channel when I did, I doubt I'd have you know nearly 20,000 subscribers now because there's so many good people out there doing it who <laughs> all deserve good followers. But it's just trying to find the right one that suits you. And you, as a as a I suppose an influencer or, or a YouTuber, I like the fact that there's so many other people doing so many different things. Because I get my yeah. mates going, oh, did you see so and so doing that? I said, I said, well, yeah. no, I didn't actually. I said, but how do they do that? But <laughs> it just gives you diversity. And that's what it's all about. It's all about someone's okay. There's a few duffers out there. There's a few people that are like, <laughs> uh, what are they talking about? Do you know what I mean? You know, but you know, yeah. It's even if you don't agree or do everything someone else does, there there might be two or three small details that can make all the difference when you're doing your management that next year. And you know, those details add up over time to being successful. I feel like. All right. So. I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, you you could, I mean, on on the on, on the forums, for example, it's quite a hot topic. There was a lot of people who were like treatment free, and there was this like war between the treatment free and the non treatment free. And and when they're on the forums, they're battling each other. But actually, <laughs> now there's a lot of people doing their own channels. It's actually good because the treatment free people are doing their thing, and then the treatment people are doing their thing, and we're kind of getting this interaction now where we're seeing the maybe it isn't such a bad idea or no that didn't work or but it i just just don't feel it's like it was it's not so cut and a cutthroat as it was years ago i just feel that's kind of youtube has probably helped that you know because people yeah. can see it and people are able to give a when you're doing your youtubes as well you are well i am i'm kind of telling them how i feel it is so people seeing yeah. that are thinking well he's not making this up and it sounds genuine so i'll <laughs> give it a go and that's where it's broken down those boundaries. I think it's a really good thing. Absolutely. Um, it, a lot of other beekeepers, this is less for me because I never felt like it was that contentious, but like the uh, war against ho hobbyists versus commercial, like uh, not that I've sensed it, but a lot of other bee like commercial beekeepers talked about how there used to be a lot more anim animosity between the two. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> and that's exactly what why hive life is such a massive surprise and i and i've thought about what what makes hive life so special myself i know i know it came and said all this thing and that but i think it's because <laughs> it's a bigger body of amateurs who want a more rounded uh help than just professionals saying one thing you should do it like this because th th that's their job in fairness and, and it's just, <laughs> they are dealing with numbers whereas the the amateur guys are a little bit less experienced but they they want to just do a good job they want to do keep bees well and it's, it's very, i don't want to say you know all professionals <laughs> are just miserable and they don't help out because they haven't got time half the time yeah they're doing their job yeah, and, they've got big volumes and, they're, and that is half the problem and that's where this kind of misunderstanding yeah. comes in you know i think yeah i mean you there aren't very many commercial beekeepers who you wouldn't say are extremely busy <laughs> I know. It wouldn't. Yeah. Like they're just all. Well, the season is so short. Sure. Yeah. They've got so much yeah. to, to get through in that one season. There's so much on the line where amateurs are a little yeah. bit, um, a little bit less pressured, let's say. But <laughs> yeah. what, what amazed me was see amateurs over here in Europe, like three, 10, 15, maybe 40 yeah. hives. In America, sideliners, 200 hives. And like, yeah. like, what's the sideliner? Oh, it's the same as an amateur. <laughs> ah, right. Well, how does that work then? No, it's they have a second <laughs> job. And so it's a bit like me, but I don't have a second job anymore. So, uh, yeah. Um, you know. Uh, Richard Allison says, I'd love to go to Hive Life. It may have to make a holiday uh, to the US out of it. <laughs> I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. It's, the tickets are going to sell out fast, though, so you, you better be on the ball. I mean, Cayman says he thinks it'll be a month or two, but I'd say, you know, it, it took a few months last time. I don't think it'll take nearly as much time. No, no, so, I think the vibe is even bigger, maybe for the next Yeah, one, for sure. Yeah. But he may be able to have more people in the conference. I don't know. So I haven't spoken yeah, to that... Cayman for a while because I know he's been in um, having a well-deserved bit of R&R &R in, uh, in Hawaii. So... <laughs> Yes, um, yeah, I heard that. But too. he's back. He's back at it now. I see his posters, so, which I haven't even seen his post yet. So, um, Richard, come on! I know it's uh, terrible. You know, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> neglecting my duties. You know, as a fellow bee, uh, 
fellow YouTuber. I, I guess I forgive you, but. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to talk about, um, so how do you, do you introduce Virgin Queens? And if so, how do you do it? Okay. Um, I've just seen at that same time, the question has come up. Uh, perfect timing. I do do it, but I do do it at certain times of the year. So what I would do is I'd raise a load of queens around swarm season. Yep. And my personal opinion is, and I know Corey has talked about this recently, <laughs> and I totally yep. agree with his method as well. Brilliant. He When he does it, he does it when he makes his nukes and then he cuts the cells out and leaves it six to seven days, not 67 yep. days, six to seven <laughs> days. Um, but then he introduces his virgins at that time. So there's no way they can make a new queen. Yep. because they've got no larvae and also but they're still brewed in the colony which is that really important factor but i i totally agree with that but what i do is i go around to my colonies and i have i keep a bank of um I ba i've got a banking frame here for example this is what i kind of use i've got a better picture but that's the kind of thing i'd use i've got loads of these uh roller cages and i stick that into a really strong queenless colony uh full of nurse bees and i can keep my virgins yep. probably going for 10 days easily um providing i keep so it gives me about a week to a week to week and a half if I need a virgin, I've got one, and I'll go back yep. and do a round of introducing virgins. But it's all when when you've got swarming colonies, you're gonna have virgins. So I always think that the colony, when it loses its first cast, provided yeah. you can cut out the other cells in time before the next lot go, which invariably we don't because they're just so busy. And that's why I'm building the new honey house to help ease that pressure. <laughs> Um, if you can get a virgin to run in then, a running virgin in then, you often solve a lot of problems, which you do anyway in colonies. If you've got the start of drone laying, if you, sorry, uh, yeah, laying workers, if you can get a yeah. running virgin in, she will fix most of the problems often. Not always, but it's like virgins are such a good tool to have. So what I do is I literally open the cage, I run her out onto the frame, and I smother it all in syrup. I use a bottle like this, and I just, I just drench everything in syrup. So it kind of... If you watch the bees, they'll all be like running around a bit and shimmering and that. You put syrup on it, and they just kind of stop. And then it gives you a time to just hose over everything else with more syrup, put the frame back in gently, put the lid on. By the time they've cleaned themselves up, that queen is usually safe. Usually. Wow. No, I've actually I, never I heard anyone do that. Here. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I can get bees here that are so bad that I can put them under a pushing cage, <laughs> check for queen cells. The queen starts to lay under the cage, so day seven, day eight, even later than normal uh, after there's, all the cells have been cut out, but there's still a little bit of brood. I release the queen. There's full of cells in the, uh, underneath the cage, sorry, full of larvae underneath the cage. Yeah. I come back three or four days later. They've killed the queen, and they've made a, a queen cell with the larvae she, or with the eggs she laid. I'm like, uh, why? <laughs> Everything that, that else happened to me. Done. Yep. Yeah, it's just like, I, okay, whatever. <laughs> At least you, you think that maybe you've got some half decent genetics because they made it from a from an egg for, or a larvae from that queen. From the, that what you chose, yeah. Like. Yeah. But um, do you you think, know, I think that's do you, about as far as you can. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it happens. Do you think it has anything to do with the British black bee influence on yours? or? Uh, well, Euro European. Uh, yeah, yeah. We have yeah, you, the European um, Apis mellifera mellifera, it's pretty mongrelish. <laughs> that, they yeah. we reckon that that's most of the reason why. But I'm probably just as much of the cause of the problem because I bring in Buckfast, uh, Buckfast mated queens. I, I bring in some Italian sometimes from, not Italian queen, but they're Buckfast mated for my climate zone. So the genetics are selected yeah. from around here. They've been selected well. They do well in this climate zone. They're raised in Italy so they can be raised earlier. Um, and then um, they are really good queens here. So yeah. um, that, that works well for me. But um, when they cross, that's when you get issues because they can be nasty. Yeah. So then you are really fuel, fueling if you let them cross and they, you get a lot going and you're fuel, fueling the bad drones yourself. But yeah. you've got to do it because the honey crops you get from the, my own opinion, from my experience, the honey crops you get from the Apis from Malifa and Malifa here are terrible. You know, they'll, yeah, they'll overwinter um, a tiny colony this big. They'll spend all spring building up. They'll give you a summer crop, but hardly anything in the spring. You can't split them because they're too small. It's like, why bother? So it's worth having yeah. decent queens, even if you have to deal with the aftermath of having a few dry crosses. Yeah.
yeah so that that's kind of how it works for me um yeah so so to confirm um nancy tasker you drench the workers with syrup and then do you, so you said you put the virgin on on the doorstep yeah, or on I, top of the frames i i put the the frame on its side i release the queen she walks out onto the frame stubbles around for a bit for five two or three minutes then starts to like probe into cells and then you just get the the your bottle out and literally just just a fine drizzle not like drench it but what i'm saying is yeah you can put plenty on the other bees on the other frames i'm not worried about it but obviously don't drench the queen completely just <laughs> a fine yeah. trace over her and then they'll lick her as well and as soon as you see hmm. that licking they're like and then then she's <laughs> as good as accepted you know what i mean so you're like okay in we go and it gives you that time to just lower that frame in and then uh usually you get success but it does depend like like corey says you yeah. can do everything and uh and just not sometimes they still don't do it you know but most of the time they do the best way is to cut out those cells and get your timing right but still having brood in that colony yeah. is a really good thing yeah it's it's about the pheromones i i meant to bring this up i talked to actually i mentioned this to corey too they did this study it was actually in a bob video um where they switched like a hundred queens like they just pulled out a lane queen from one hive and a lane queen from the other hive switched them and like 99 percent of the time or 90 plus percent of the time they accepted them just mm. crazy because because the, yeah, all um, the pheromones are right th there's a yeah. buck fast breeder who uh, i mentioned before peter little who unfortunately died um the end of 2021 yeah. i think it was so uh, yeah um, I might just maybe got that wrong a bit, but he very recently died within the last just yeah. over the last year. And uh, he used to do exactly the same, and no one could understand how yeah. he did it, but he knew the condition of his queens and how he could do it. Yeah, he had this he just really cool ability, and I was like, wow, that's so awesome, <laughs> brother Adam you know? 2.0, uh, maybe. <laughs> no, yeah, Adam. yeah, but I just think oh, he also had really, really nice queens that he spent his whole life breeding, and he had really good stock, yeah. you know. so um yeah it's it's a complicated issue but the the pushing cage is really um to me the uh the number one way of doing the absolute utmost you can if you've got a mated queen that has um you've gone through all the process of not just raising that queen but then getting her mate and she's come back and you've harvested yeah. her and you put her in a colony only to get killed you've got to do that last hurdle <sighs> yourself otherwise yeah. it's just doesn't it doesn't ring any bells it doesn't put the icing on the yeah. cake it's like you've done all that work and you're just throwing away a queen you've got to get it every chance once she's in a lane as i was going through some nukes today or just one nuke i went through two actually because it poured a rain and i always say this every year you and we mentioned nukes before about overwinter nukes when you go through those overwinter nukes and they're all absolutely um Packed out, yeah. bursting with bees it's <laughs> worth every single bit of work that you've done yep. because you just can't believe you've got that mega resource yeah i got 14 out of my 15 queens are from last summer so they should be hitting you know their full stride this year as bob likes to say i'm not exactly sure how it works because we are our, our laying season is somewhat shorter than his but i think they would should be by his rule about hitting their their stride because they were made yeah. in like july last year um so I'm, I'm really excited i had good results like last year um was my first year that i like actually had strong bees in the spring like I'd overwintered most of my colonies in years before, but last year is when by like May 15th or, or the beginning of June, -ish, all of them were the same size and they were all filling out the entire deep that I wanted them to. And so that was, that was like, that's a big deal to me. And when I'm thinking about Etienne's talk and it's like, I, I know I can have like, I, some of my hives are relatively weak and I think I have enough big ones that I can kind of balance out. But my goals next year is, you know, to get about 85 or 90% like this year, but the 90% that survive, I want to have more of them that are, you know, at least medium to high strength. Like that's really yeah. what I'm going to strive for. Same concepts and overwintering them. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing more amazing than opening up your hives in the spring and seeing a big yeah. cluster. It's just yeah. like, what is that? And you know that that, it's yeah, it's gonna, just... you're gonna split it quicker. You're going to make more honey from it. It's going to give you so yeah. many more possibilities because you've overwintered that well. You know, you you just can't even begin to. It's yeah. like the ice. That is the icy on the cake, to be honest. You know, absolutely. But I... in some years where they're terrible, you get in, in a year. <laughs> I remember Mike. Yeah. And he, I know Mike's listening. I remember him yeah. saying specifically in a, in a year when you have lots of losses, the colonies that are left are also weak 
and that's the problem you have. And you've yeah. got to buy frames to brood or, or or really spend longer combining them and juggling them around to get them stronger. And that's what can, can cause you yeah. a, lot of, a lot of grief. But I'm, it's, it's, you just have to put the time in. Keeping bees is really yeah. so difficult now. You've just got to put the time in. There's no <laughs> yep. way you can not do it. You just have to, everything you've got to give them all the time. Yep. You know? Can't agree more. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna nuke some hives this spring. My small ones that are only like a frame or two a cluster. I, I'm getting these insulated nukes, and so I'm just gonna toss them in there for the early spring once I can get my first inspection in. And it may not make a huge difference, but one, I, I love trying new things. That's all beekeepers do. And two, yeah. I think it could could potentially make a decent difference. So what you're yeah. gonna do? You're gonna transfer. Just run six of their frames. Movie. Yeah, I'm going to so, move so six gonna, of their you, frames. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And are you going to hopefully and, they're going to requeen themselves, or are you going to give them a queen? Um. So they all have young queens, and assuming the queens are good, I'll just leave them in there. I, I'm just yeah, going to yeah. move them into the nukes for the early spring. So my first inspection will be between like April 4th and April 30th, somewhere in there, and then I'll move them into the nuke and I'll boost them with other colonies later on once they're big enough. But I'm oh, just gonna. Yeah, yeah. I'm just interested to see, like, if if decreasing their space in half, because this is also in response partially to Etienne's talk. He's like, it matters the volume to how many bees you have. So if I cut their space down yeah. in half and give them an insulated nuke box with no nooks and crannies or wooden, you yeah. know, little holes, um, I think that could help them move quickly out of spring. My ex colleague who I used to work with, he's adamant that one of the best ways to manage bees is is do a similar thing to that is at the end of the season anyway we go we take a nuke at the end of the season in july yeah we put two partitions in and a foundation so essentially the main body of bees are on seven frames get rid of another frame put them in a nuke they overwinter better you can move them around easier and they explode yeah. in the spring yeah. it's a lot of work because you're moving a lot of boxes that you've got to take the boxes <laughs> yeah. out but there again you could use that as an opportunity to clean all your brood boxes out you know once and for all and get them all uh, i don't know I'm probably going to try a, a an apiary like that and see how it does. I think it's a really good method because you're yep. reducing that volume and you're giving the bees more honey with less room to heat. Blah blah blah. Um, I think the um, I think the possibilities are better for the bees. For sure. It's yeah, I run all. Well. Yes, yes, yeah. I run all single deeps. Oh, no, it's not entirely true. I have two doubles, but those are just for making queens. Um, yeah. But the rest of mine are singles. And, you know, like when, when at bee class, I was told, and I quote, you know, if you don't have two deeps full of bees, they're not going to make it through winter. There's, it just never happens. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, partially that was because it was coming from the first master beekeeper in Maine who started in the 1980s. But it's, um, m most people keep double deeps, but they're like definitely, partially, I think because of YouTube, a lot of people are switching to single deeps, just the convenience of them. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, for instance, we, we have Dayton's, as you know. Um, yeah. The Dayton, the Dayton frame is pretty big. That's a Dayton yeah. frame. You can see the size there. <laughs> yeah. um, it's it's a, it's like two inches deeper than a lang, basically about the same. Yeah. With two inches deeper than. Uh, are we back? Yeah, you're good. Are we good? All yeah. that, okay. We, we don't yeah, do yeah. any spring um, swarm control we <laughs> with like things like Demare and that because with our Dadens, they're just way too big to add another brood box. So if you're going to do anything, you just have yeah. to split with a nuke. Um, yeah, it's I, that seems like the perfect size. It's almost like a deep in, or well, it's not quite as big as a deep and a medium, but it's a little bit bigger. You know, it seems it seems like ideal for sure. Well, I, I, I would I would say it's um, for, for well. For us here, it seems to work. The other, the other thing you've got to remember is when you're a bee, when you're becoming more of a professional beekeeper, when you want to sell nukes, you've got to sell nukes on frames that people are going to buy them on. There's no point in having your kind of frame because you like it if no one else yeah. is going to buy it. When you <laughs> and also it's not just the getting rid of your nukes and making them a bit of money and paying for your beekeeping. Yeah. It's also the fact that um, uh, I've just lost my thread a bit. It's, it's, you you've just got to have the resources. You've got to keep all your what's the word? All your equipment standardized. That's the what same, I'm yeah, for. standardized, so you can switch in between in and out. Yeah, uh, yep. and often you see people, and I'm kind of guilty as well. I made a load of homemade 
I, I had some some standard data nukes I made out of wood. Yeah. But I partitioned them down the middle to make twin mating nukes. So I had these little frames that I made myself. And you know what? They didn't work that well, but I was able to take the middle of the partition out and use them as normal nuke boxes. But I had all these frames left that basically I had to just burn because it was um, very, very difficult to, to use them in anything else. And there's a, a standardized mini plus mating nuke yeah. that's got the same size frames, slightly different, but basically the same size frames, which is universal that you can do things with. So if I learned from that lesson that you really need to as soon as you can be universal but be universal and you know that someone's going to buy it. for you guys it's langs really for us it's data yeah. but for data sure. seems to work okay here we, we yep. do have a 12 frame version uh there's a 12 frame data as well which is even bigger but not many people really use it so yeah yeah, so what's normal for where you live? Do you guys do one boot box? Is that the general um Yeah, we are all uh, one, yeah. 10 frames, ten, those frames yep. that you saw, one brood box, 10 frames. Um, we all yeah. use queen excluders. Um, I know there's good evidence to say that maybe you don't, but we we want we, we demand a spring crop, and we yeah. want to take the spring crop off where, as soon as we can, because otherwise it crystallizes, so we get that off before it crystallizes. Yeah. So you're kind of, do I have a queen excluded? Don't I? If you don't have one, then you've got chrysalis honey. But I know you could warm it in your warming room at the end of the season, like Mike Palmer does, for example, and extract the whole yeah. lot afterwards. A week and a half at 100 F, everything comes out. That's a really good way of doing it. But I, I don't know if it would work for us because I don't want to sell a floral honey. I want to sell minimum of two or three types of honey. So we have a spring flow, which finishes usually – mid to end of April. So I'll be putting the supers on literally in four yeah. weeks with whatever I've got. And then we'll harvest it the third week of May before it starts to crystallize, hopefully. That's yeah. what I've done with my new honey house. I've built a warming room or will have done when it's finished. So that I can <laughs> yes. the, the idea is I can harvest my honey, I can stick it in the warming room, and I can go straight out to my hives and spend a week out there mm. going through them, beekeeping right at the peak moment when they're most likely to be swarming. Yeah. Yep. So because I've taken the honey off. I might not have got the boxes back on, but I will have spare boxes. And that's another key. Like Ian showed, you take two off, you put two back on. The bees are straight up in there. There's no pressure in the Absolutely. column. Absolutely. Brilliant yeah. idea. You know, so logical, yeah. you know, <laughs> but you need equipment. So that's what everyone does when they grow. You have to get the extra equipment. But so that's what I built into it. But um, the Dayton are, are good for us, it seems. There's, it's not the right, I wouldn't say it's perfect. I'd actually probably like to try some yeah. Langs because <laughs> Langs, are, I know, for instance, for instance, my mate Ollie in Ireland, he's gone to Langs for his brood boxes and his honey supers. They yeah. weigh a ton, but he's got an easy loader. So for him, that works well. It's a really difficult dilemma because, so what he'd done, he standardized all his, all his stuff to keep everything universal and it works. You know, um, but trying to lift when I'm cell building with the data and you've got two brood boxes and a super in the middle, trying to get that top, even for me on a, you know, on a step, trying to get that top brood box off when it's been backfilled with honey because all the broods hatched yeah. out and there's a flow on. It's just crazy weight. It's probably maybe it 40, 40 kilos, it's, you know, maybe eight, 60 pounds, maybe. I don't know. Crazy yeah. weight of honey. Came in. That's always hotly debated among beekeepers. Like how how heavy is a deep box? And a lot of people will say a hundred pounds. But the thing that left an impression on me is came in uh, did a video where he like weighed weighed himself with the box and then just himself and compared the weight and it was like he said it was a hundred percent full. He showed the frames and it was eighty pounds. Which so that's that's the number I go off of normally eight yeah. pounds per frame. Yeah. yeah. Well, Cayman obviously needs a ladder to get to the top of his boxes. I don't <laughs> think so. Smart, well, that's you know? that's not much of a question, Richard. We all know that. He uh, <laughs> he, he he embraces the jokes, though. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to get a load of grief back now for saying that. But you know what? Bring it on. Let's have a good good laugh. Oh, uh, trust me, Nat Natalie and I made fun of him the entire time on our live stream. So don't worry about it. I know. I know. Cool. Uh, yeah. So when Grange Beast was talking about how. You know, here at least they, you know, a lot of the older beekeepers will tell you you have to have double deeps, which double be deeps, they absolutely do work, but it's not like bees are going to survive in any box if they, um, mm -hmm. you know, if they have low mite loads, lots of food and 
Uh, there are plenty of bees. It doesn't matter what size they are. I yeah, mean, and it's, it's I've just... seen evidence. I've seen evidence where they've given bees extra insulation, a bit like what Etchin was saying. Uh, yeah, well, definitely like what he was saying. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've overwintered in tiny, in single, single mini plus in in freezing cold weather. They just made yeah. it through run because they use hardly any. They don't go out because they know it's minus twenty outside. <laughs> yeah, from the environment, and they're super well wrapped, and they'll survive just fine. You know. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I wanted to talk about your uh, honey here. So do you like the earlier season honey flavor or your later season? Uh, well, I actually do like the both, but I probably yeah. prefer more the summer honey because the summer honey is quite strong. But even though I, you might have seen I have, um, uh, what's the word? I have uh, made a lot of, poked a lot of fun at the, and we do a buckwheat honey as well because there's a farmer yeah. I work with and he has like big air buckwheat and it's really stinky honey because it lasts like, <laughs> really strong like because it was so yeah. hot and dry the honey we did have i had like 400 kilos which yeah. is probably nearly a thousand nearly a thousand pounds in weight so it's a good harvest but the hives after are in a complete mess and yeah. uh but it was it was, I have to say it was worth it because the the taste of the honey is so intense but we didn't actually have much of a uh, a chestnut honey flow because it was it was so dry by that time so the spring flow yeah. was good we had a bit of an extra spring flow afterwards the second flow which was a um uh which was a uh what we call a miela or a honeydew honey because the weather was so beautiful and perfect all the aphids were exuding yep. um mm. and i i got a, a i don't know if yeah. you saw i got a and an, an analysis done. They call it an échantillon in French. I, got, I sent it off <laughs> yeah. to the laboratory uh, and they came back with some miella and it was a separate crop we had. So I've still got a barrel of that left, <laughs> but it was like a really intense flavor. And I've never, we've never had it before. We've sometimes seen one or two frames in exceptionally good weather, which occasionally happens. We're like, where's that come from? And we now know why it happens and how it happens. But then when you have a spring like we had last year, it's just exceptionally yeah. good weather all the way through. That's why we had it. So we just, well, that's what it is. It was very interesting. Mm. Then the summer honey was literally come and gone really quickly because the, there was so little moisture in the ground by then that even yep. deep down where often the chestnuts will still bloom really well because they're, they're deep rooted and yep. the bramble, I might have a few showers, keeps the bramble going. It didn't do that and it was come and gone. So the, the summer honey was nice, but not as intensely strong. I absolutely love the chestnut honey. It is my favorite. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's probably been two years, three years since we've had a really good chestnut flow because it stinks. When you get a really good flow, <laughs> the bees come back like yellowy green because they've been in the pollen and the fronds. It's really intense. And the hive absolutely reeks. When it, it's probably a bit like when you get goldenrod that really flows and you get a stinky goldenrod. It's that kind of thing. And you, hmm. it just it, it, the hives absolutely reek of it of an evening. You know, you get that wow. low hum when they're drying the honey and you walk past like... Oh, it's rancid, but you're like, that's a good rancid. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you have a good association with it naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's, um, you know, I, where I live, we have like 50 50 shot at Goldenrod or whatever our fall flow is. My first year didn't have to feed a drop. They filled two deeps without any help. Just bam, wow. done. My second year, it's late September, and I'm like, they don't have any food. I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> so I fed them yeah. a bunch and I, I got, you know, three out of five through winter. So I still did okay. But uh, that's kind of, that was kind of my lesson in the fact that I can't just, um, just assume they're getting a fall flow. And so pretty much every other year we've gotten a fall flow and then the next year, no. So it's, it's, it's a challenging place to gauge because you don't know if you should go for the honey crop or not because of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm kind of um, re-evaluating everything I do from late summer onwards now because uh, if we get a really good ivory flow, uh, which we always leave um, for the bees, yeah. Uh, there's kind of two thoughts. I I now after seeing Bob Binney's video and the evidence he put up about yeah. let summer feeding of one to one to stimulate that flow of yeah. uh, sucrose based yeah more sucrose yeah. based rather than fructose which is what we use at the moment i think i've been missing a trick for years because we've been buying fructose yeah. throwing it on putting it on too strong uh, you know i'm like this is like so amateur stuff really the way everyone <laughs> talks about it now it's like what have you been doing rich we've been doing this for years i'm like yeah i know i see that and that's why you've got amazing <laughs> Connolly coming to winter but 
Um, that's what I'm going to reevaluate, and I'm going to be going feeding much lighter syrups in the summer now as soon as I can. But I'm not going to worry about feeding them up because I know that we can get the feed in in October, November when they are. Because our, generally our bees, most years, they 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 run well into October just for brood rearing. We yeah. always seem to get the temperature plummeting about the first week of November. It goes from like 10, 12, 13 degrees C, which I suppose is what you call your 60s, is it, around there? So there's a bit of fly. Uh, there's not a lot. But yeah, I think that would be because 100 is, conversion. I think, yeah, it's it's like it's around that. Yeah, it, it takes so, it always takes so anyway, a second it's to just flying yeah. weather. There's loads of bees. Yeah. They fly well still. But then into November, they literally the temperature goes down to seven, eight or nine degrees C. And that's when it all stops. But yeah. up till then. If you haven't fed up, if you haven't got your bees fed up, you can still chuck the syrup on and they'll just take it down like you wouldn't believe. And that's like, you know, like you can do really easily. But so I think yeah. everyone has this emphasis in October is got to feed, got to feed, got to feed. Winter's coming. I think you start with a lighter syrup in September and just let the brood yeah. build up first. Because if you feed too much too early, you block up that brood nest. And I think... Yep. Um, you're you're done straight away because I'm actually caging yep. my queens, as you know. So I've got to give my bees every stimulus to lay loads of winter bees. So uh, and yeah, this is the cage I use. I I've done the presentation yep. on it at Hive Life. Um, Cayman's going to try some this year because I left him with twenty cages. Mm, is it going to happen though? Mm. Yes, it's a little he empty, Richard. He will. He mm. get you see. It's all, it's all where you when you cage your queens. It's all about if it works for you, and you've got to have um you've got to have the right environment to do it you've got to have a dearth at the end of your yeah. summer flow and you've got to have a prolonged dearth where you can just use that tool because you're working with the bees when you cage the queen because the cage yeah. the, the cages that this one is specifically designed <laughs> to give the bees really good access for both sides so that, yeah. that sits in the middle of the frame that's your frame there and this sits in the middle of it so your queen can get access from the nurse bees and all that from both sides so there's no stress on her they're not like where yeah. she's gone She's there all the time, but she's not laying, and she's not laying in a time when she wouldn't be really laying much anyway. So all yeah. you're doing is like exaggerating what she's not doing. So the bees don't take it out on her, and you can get that clear brood break, and then you vape after with oxalic acid one or two times, and the the effect is fantastic. And because also don't yeah. forget, there's other benefits to brood to uh, brood breaks is the fact that they'll clean every cell out in that colony, and then when that queen comes to lay again. Brrr, all over yeah, the place. Yeah. She's laying away. Um, she's laying away everywhere. That I mean, um, I I kind of learned how to do this myself. I'm not taking any claim for it. I saw yeah. the Italian guys doing it because they get a big dearth the same time as us. And I thought, hey, you know what? That might work really well. Because I'm <laughs> I'm using Apivar in my nukes in the summer. Because what I'm doing is when I do my splits, I'm putting my queens in these cages in the summer about second well about the second to fourth week of so the whole of july i'm caging queens basically it's frantically going yeah. through making the split i haven't taken the honey off yet but i'm making the split i'm caging my queens because we've got that dearth and i know the dearth every year will be there and they won't take it out on the queens so then i cage the queens i then harvest the honey and as soon as the honey's yeah. off i treat against mites and it's like just a process it's exhausting but when you see the results, <laughs> yeah. you your mites down so quickly. It's worth it. And those yeah. interviews are so clean. Last mm. year, a different ball game. But <laughs> yeah. the first year I did it was really good. So yeah, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. But it's one of the methods we can use. I, I said in my presentation at Hive Life that I just feel that we've got to use every single method we can and expand the are we back yep you're, you're good okay, okay. <laughs> yeah right, i want to seize upon that yeah. moment that the bees are presenting to us yeah. and use it if if it's going to work to our advantage and that because these opportunities now with all the other problems we're having with our bees are so small and so refined that that's what we've got to work even harder it's not i mean I still got, you know, I've got mates in Australia who still got bees that haven't got mites on them. And the way they talk about their bees, they're just like, oh, yeah, mate, we just threw them over there and come and collect the honey a couple of weeks later. No problem with that. Easily. I'm like, I'm so jealous, you know? <laughs> I know, yeah. 
Maybe not for long. We'll see about that, though. Well, uh, it looks like, unfortunately, the the um, uh, yeah. unfortunately they are, they've lost the battle. Uh, Richard Allison's yeah. just asked, "Did I try the Scalvini cage?" Yes, I have done. And, and you don't like it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Scalvini cage is is a small square, similar size yeah. to that, but it's only on one side of the frame. So the idea is the queen lays in it, and there's actually pre-built um, little uh, comb in plastic, and they'll build it out. But yeah. The queen can't lay properly but so she keeps she's technically in laying condition i yeah. believe but the bees keep cleaning it out because they because they, they can't cap the larvae properly and yeah it's supposed to keep her laying but a lot of people i know have used it have, have issues with it it just doesn't work for me i like this cage because it allows complete movement through the whole cage and i never have an issue with that it's like when she's in there i come back she's in perfect condition when i release her mm. um yeah. It's such a, it's I, like the first time I did it, this cage and the Queens thing, I was literally thinking, well, it's kind of SH1T or bust. I've got yeah. to do it if it works. And then I released all these Queens. And when you see the brood after, you're like, wow, that's just amazing. You're like literally tiptoeing around the apiary because you think you're the best thing since sliced bread, but it's <laughs> worth it. If you can do yeah, it, I, use it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I have to find, uh, I, maybe they have on an MSI, I'll check. Um, I, I'm interested because we get a hard dearth from about the beginning of July and till maybe for the rest of the year, but they, they pick, start to pick up again in later fall, um, like mid August or so they, cause of the pollen increases in late, late July, early August. And so yeah. I definitely have three weeks where I could shut her down and that would, she'd start laying right about when the winter bees would start again in early August. Yeah. And I think that it could definitely work. And if it's, it's, it's uh, effective, it two colonies. yeah, yeah. And then you go, wow, you've got very amazing. little to lose. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. Because you can still treat your, your bees after yeah. anyway. Yeah. If you don't think it's worked. And I don't think you'll lose your queens. So um, I, I think anyone who can do it should consider it because I yeah. think it's something that can work really well for some people. Um, yeah. One, and so, Lagrange B just said the cage will be yeah. difficult to use with plastic frames. No, it isn't. You just cut the plastic out and stick yeah. the cage in. Just the square. And then and then, the yeah. I, I leave my cages in all year round because that's yeah. what I'm going to do. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put a block of wood in here, the other parts of the season. But yeah. in, even in a flow, they often don't build in that cage. They don't build uh, honey in it. And if they do, yeah. you literally, with your hive tool, you open up the top, like if I can get this front off, and you just put your hive tool in and you scrape out the honey, done. And then you can put your queen stone in it because they'll come in yeah. and they'll clean it all out while the queen's yep. in there. She's a bit sticky, they'll lick her clean. It's, it's yep. not, um, it kind of works for me. You know, yeah. like, there is guys who go to the, we have a heather crop in, in a lot of Europe, which starts yep. usually August. So caging queen's end really isn't an option because they need the bees to be growing for the heather. So they've got to treat yeah. the amateurs late or something else, but yeah. Um, I don't know. I kind of, I found something that works for me and everyone says if it works for you, stick to it. And that's what I feel is yeah. the right thing to do. Um, mites are a nightmare. We've all, we're all having issues. Ugh. I don't think we're getting on top of them. Yeah, they're and, mites. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I know Ian's been on about that as well in, in many ways. Um, everybody's having issues with mites, even though we're supposed to be controlling them. With There's all these yeah. different viruses. You know, it's uh, yeah. a sub-lethal <laughs> lethal level, don't they? Dif different levels of virus yeah. now and things like that we're, we're learning about all the time. But Yeah, it's just tough. It is. Yeah. Any, anyone starting well, beekeeping now yeah. would go like, why are you even bothering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah like you know it, what yeah. is why do you want to bother with that what's the point you know yeah um but <laughs> because we do <laughs> yeah. yeah well thanks for coming on tonight rich or well tonight for you <laughs> afternoon for me but well, I, thanks for coming yeah, on that late. Thanks, thanks for coming on earlier it was great um it's been <laughs> yeah. really good and uh I, honestly i really enjoyed chatting it's been great nice to meet you anyway and uh um i'm sure we'll meet up again sometime probably at another hive life but, uh, Sounds really good. Cool. I'm I'm gonna be there next year. Yep. So. Oh, I hope thanks. So. If, if I get if yeah. I get the invite. <laughs> <laughs> and um, good luck for the season for you. Anyway, I'll be interested to hear your. Well, I'm following you now on. Uh, yeah. On um, YouTube and. 
Instagram. Uh, yeah. I look forward to seeing yeah. your progress, but um, <laughs> and hopefully you'll be following me a bit because I've got a lot of mess to sort out. So I can show you how I sort out a lot of mess and hopefully bring everything back up to how it's supposed to be. So yeah, we've all got challenges in our own ways. Absolutely. Thank you, Richard. Okay, take yeah. care. Anyway, nice to see everybody. Thanks for joining. All the people who joined us yeah. been great. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.